Buenos días. Good morning. Welcome to our meeting with Lilian Tintore, activist of human rights in Venezuela. First of all, I want to welcome as well to Efli, the president of uh, News for Univision and CEO of uh, uh, the media, who is going to be interviewing Lillian uh, this morning. Thank you, Lillian, and thank you, Isaac, for uh, being here with us today. And finally, I say hello to everybody who is here with us virtually from all over the world through our webcast. From the arrest of her husband, leader of the opposition uh, in Venezuela, Leopoldo Lopez, Lillian has become in a very important voice of human rights in her country. This morning, she's going to answer questions about uh, the recent uh, sentence uh, uh, of her husband and the other eight uh, political prisoners and the position of the international community for his liberation. And uh, also, you will hear about the political um, landscape uh, of Venezuela um, in the next elections in December. Lillian, we are very thankful to have you here with us. And uh, I also want to say that Venezuela has, uh, is very lucky to have you as a spokesperson uh, towards the change. Thank you very much. And then I give you the floor, Lillian and Isaac. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. We are going to have a conversation with Lillian. I will try to have her uh, be the one who will be telling us uh, and that uh, will be telling us about her difficult experience and then we will have time for you to be able to pose questions. Susan, where is Susan? Susan, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here. And as a reporter, I think that it's difficult to find a, a story that is closest uh, to the Nelson Mandela one in a continent than this one. And I think this is a, an important opportunity to be able to be here with you. Thank you. Lillian, how did you explain to Manuela and to Leosan that uh, their father uh, has been sentenced and is in jail. Well, uh, well, uh, my daughter is six years old and uh, my little boy is two years old and since Leopoldo uh, is not home, uh, actually he's unjustly incarcerated and they, we've been going to all the hearings and uh, hoping to have justice and uh, uh, waiting for him to be free because uh, he's an innocent man and should not be there and then he was sentenced and I did not explain it to them. What, are, what was I going to tell them? You know, that they gave him 14 years without any evidence, with no witnesses, with, uh, you know, uh, based on lies. Well, they know that their father is innocent and he should not be in jail, and they know about the truth. They know that he is in jail and he's going to get out, and they hope and wait every day for him to return home. And then every day I say that that day will come. Every day I say that they will come and it will be for us at home and for all Venezuelans because what we are living at my place at home, all Venezuelans are living uh, it as well, in somehow. They feel attacked, persecuted, uh, without future, no progress, uh, with inflation and uh, a high cost uh, for the living and then living in fear. So I cannot just talk uh, about me and my children. I can talk about so many families who don't have their father because they're not even uh, in jail. I mean, these persons are dead. There were 25,000 uh, deaths in Venezuela, and then be behind that number, there are 25,000 families, and that's a reality that is real in Venezuela. And that was last year, and uh, this year, 2015, it's going to be, and these are official numbers. One of the most dangerous years in the history of Venezuela. 
because what we lived, uh, it's really worrisome. We are in a humanitarian crisis beyond the political, social, and economic crisis. We have had very difficult moments, very difficult and uh, unjust. Uh, how is it living in fear? Uh, live under a lot of pressure, but I think that uh, the most important thing is uh, to lose. You know, I, lo I, 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 I really lost my fear because I became liberated, you know, uh, in front of the militarism with long, uh, you know, the shotguns and whatever, you know, I lost my fear. Well, how was it? Well, actually, uh, well, uh, more than 20 uh, uh, authorities came uh, dressed in black uh, with hoods and with uh, rifles and um, they came uh, into the house, they came in and then my, my legs were shaking. I didn't understand. Uh, I don't think that uh, you can actually bring, you know, that many people into your home and actually with, uh, uh, with uh, lo uh, shotguns uh, into a house, well, when you uh, live in a military place and then you are always surrounded uh, by military people, or it's a different thing. You know, I went to jail one time, you know, and I said, you know, you know, I, you know, my daughter was going to be brought to me, so actually four of them got in front of me. I went through, I pushed him aside, and I continued. I felt that they were going to shoot at me, and then I, I didn't care. So many times you actually have the force of the truth, of the arguments, of the testimony of the one that had Rosa Orozco Hayes, uh, Geraldine's mother, a 16-year-old uh, girl who actually was uh, shot. They shot her, her face uh, close range. And then Geraldine's uh, mother, she was her only daughter, 23 years old, you know. And then Rosa, who is in Venezuela, fighting for her daughter's case because after a year and seven months, justice has not been actually done to her case. So Rosa was uh, uh, with you uh, with the meeting with Biden, yes. How was that? Well, that was really very impressive because these are meetings that are very important and we are very thankful for that because the international community is key for everything that is happening in Venezuela. In Venezuela, we feel that we are alone inside Venezuela because we don't have an institution because the uh, public powers are controlled by one uh, entity, uh, the executive branch. And so what do we have, we Venezuelans? We have to look for justice uh, in the international arena and then with allied countries and with brother countries. And here in the US, we've had uh, that uh, uh, company, and we had very important meetings. Well, I took Rosa Rosco to the meeting with Biden, and, and then she had a picture of Geraldine, the way she remained. So it was the face of Geraldine with holes of, of the bullets on, on her face uh, full of blood, and we were at the meeting. And I said, Vice President Biden, I think that this is very important for you to listen. Listen to the testimony of Rosa. She's a Venezuelan woman who represents many Venezuelan women. And Rosa started telling about Geraldine and showed the picture. And Vice President Biden I picked up the photograph and was looking uh, with a lot of pain to Geraldine and then said to Rosa, I'm going to help you because I know a surgeon who will reconstruct the face for you there, and it's going to it's going to be good. It's going she's going to be perfect. And Rosa looked at him, and cried and cried and cried and cried. And vice, the vice president said, "Well, what's going on?" And Rosa said, "She was killed. We cannot do anything." So who is going to return your daughter to you alive? And it was very hard because. He understood it's not what's going to happen, what's going to be or whatever. It already happened, and we cannot allow it to continue being that way. Uh, they cannot continue violating human rights in Venezuela, and the tortures are going to be repeated, and the murders are going to be repeated, and we are going to continue on in a country where there is no democracy today, where there is an anti-democratic uh, regime, uh, and uh, it's very repressive because Leopold is in jail because he said that, and I said that and I said it louder, and I repeat it time and time again. Not only that, 
Maduro's uh, regime is corrupt, inefficient, uh, repressing, and then I'm going to add, that, uh, add the word inhuman because it does not respect what is basic, the life of Venezuelans, the lives of Venezuelans. Well, did uh, uh, Vice President um, Biden uh, commit himself to anything? Yes, to a democratic process. What's going on in Venezuela uh, has uh, uh, some repercussions in, in, in Latin America. They reject the violation of human rights that nowadays anybody who raises their voice or his or her voice, they're actually promoting human rights. But the one who remains silent is an accomplice. It's hard to say, but this is reality. It is a reality we have seen in Latin America, but we are hopeful that uh, steps are taken. And you know what? They have to be taken. According to your idea, which leaders have taken those steps? Well, it's very difficult to talk about leaders without taking into account uh, civil society, because I can talk about the presidents, vice presidents, and uh, senators, um, that actually, and also the representatives and uh, uh, all that that we visited. But uh, to me, leadership is not just uh, a position in the government but, and a political one, but it also is a leadership from the civil society. So government come and go, but people remain. And today, uh, the world is supporting Venezuela. They understand uh, what's going on in Venezuela. It's known what's going on in Venezuela with arguments, with numbers, with testimonies, uh, with uh, uh, accounts that we all tell. And of course, uh, you know, I have meetings that I remember that actually uh, paved the way for me. For example, with Mariano Rajoy, uh, he's a president. He was the first one who uh, welcomed us with great solidarity and uh, really with great valor because uh, he knew that uh, many of these meetings uh, cost him insults and sanctions and other things. And then he continued on. And he received that not, not only within the party, but also at the Moncloa Palace. And it goes beyond uh, politics um, between countries or among countries. Of course, that is valid, and it has to be respected. You know, We have to understand. Politicians do understand that. I am not a politician, so it took me a while to understand that. But, uh, uh, well, many times when I visit my husband, he says, don't, 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 you don't become desperate because things uh, uh, do uh, uh, work, you know. And what we are doing is worthwhile. So those are steps for Venezuela. How are the conditions for Leopold uh, nowadays? Uh, nowadays, How is he? And uh, tell us about his day. He's in a military jail, which is an hour away from Caracas uh, on a mountain. And then at the top of the mountain, there is a very old building, big one, where you have 150 uh, inmates. And next to that building, there is a tower that has four uh, stories. And then the only one that is in that tower is Leopoldo. My husband, he's alone, and in that tower, the Metropolitan uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Mr. Ledesma, he's also there, Manuel Ceballos, and also the one from Valencia. So they shared uh, in a limited way, but actually they left Ramo Verde, and then Leopoldo remained alone in that tower. The conditions are like uh, all, all the uh, ones in my country. They violate all the international uh, uh, norms, uh, torture, and uh, has we been tortured? Yes. Psychologically, yes. They actually uh, raided the, his cell. Uh, they threw uh, human excrement and urine through window into his cells. And then this is a two by three meters uh, cell without any light. So when the sunlight goes down, he's locked, and then they open again at 6 a.m. in the morning. And, and during that time, he's alone in the building. So we have uh, more than 14 cameras 
in this tower of four flights. Uh, then you have 14 that uh, move according to his movements. They record all the conversations uh, and all the visits. And in the uh, place where uh, the lawyers are supposed to meet with them, uh, Leopoldo discovered a recording device. So this is a basic violation of his human rights because the law, according to the Venezuelan law, uh, says it very clear. You have to have uh, free uh, uh, correspondence. Well, even his nephew's uh, letters, I mean, they looked at everything and they actually uh, take them. So Maduro's regime is really afraid that Leopoldo uh, communicates with Venezuelans. They don't want Leopoldo to be able to convey anything out from that jail, but you know why? Because uh, they, they don't want him to actually face anybody, because whenever he writes, he actually creates hope, and then he plants a seed, and so how are we going to build a Venezuela that today is in crisis, but we have the natural resources and the human resources, and then we have the way to change it. So just with his actions, or rather, rather with the actions, they want to cover something that you cannot cover anymore, because most Venezuelans want change, and uh, the, even the leaders are ready for that change. And that is why they want to block communication. And nobody has been able to see Leopoldo in a year and seven months, just uh, their direct relatives, not even the church. Monsignor Diego Padron requested permission. He received it and didn't let, it, didn't let him go in. Even uh, politicians, uh, they just blocked our doors in Ramo Verde. I'm sure you have all seen those images. They don't even respect the presidents of the world. President Felipe Gonzalez, who is part of our national defense when he came to Venezuela, he was insulted. It's really a shame because the Venezuelan people are not like that. We are not like that. Isn't it true? The Venezuelans who are here present because there are Venezuelans everywhere. We're not like that. We are cordial. We are affectionate. We are uh, loyal. And that image that the Venezuelan government is portraying is not right. I've heard you say something that uh, Maduro is not Chavez. What do you refer? Well, he's not the same person. How do they differ from each other? It's the same because they're part of the same system which failed. It's a system that has been in the country for 16 years in which they promised and they did not fulfill. Just by looking at the Venezuelan figures, you see that the system failed. And what Chavez did was to leave uh, his child, Maduro. Uh, so it's the same thing. It's the same system that the country has. Uh, and the cr country is in crisis, is in shambles, no justice. It's the same system. Chavez had a leadership inside Venezuela and in Latin America that nowadays we don't have. It doesn't exist because he left. He's gone. And we have never s experienced uh, such a brutal repression like the one that we experienced last year. Over 3,714 arbitrary detentions, arbitrary arrests. They take you to jail without even telling you why, with no arrest warrant. They just uh, uh, kidnap you and they take you away. Over 250 cases of recorded torture cases by international amnesty, uh, more than 43 murders uh, from uh, shootings from uh, uh, public officials. Out of these 43 murders, only seven deaths have been investigated. And out of these seven investigations, there's only one person in jail. That is, in sum, the 97% of impunity that we have in Venezuela. That's the figure that we have from the CAT, the Registry Against Tortures in the UN, in which uh, this document was done jointly. And that document now attests to the fact that now we live with 97% of impunity. Lillian. 
What is Maduro doing correctly? What can we credit to President Maduro? Are there things that we can say that these are positive things that he has done? Of course. People, the Venezuelans, which are part of that system, but they are captive of that system because they are threatened, because they won't be able to say a word, utter a word, because they will be kicked out. I saw that at the airport. I saw that with the Sedim police. They cannot say anything because they are threatened. They also demand a change. We need to rescue that amount of Venezuelans. And those uh, number of uh, Chavistas who are hopeful, who wish for progress, for an opportunity for their country, which want a real homeland, but a homeland with freedom. We don't have freedom in Venezuela. Venezuela does not have freedom. And I believe that when we see images of uh, Maduro uh, just with other presidents, I know that there is a dialogue. I'm dreaming of being able to have a dialogue with other authorities, just like he does with other countries. But that is not possible. There is zero dialogue. We have asked to have a dialogue. Because nowadays, you can talk to anybody in the world. You go anywhere. and You do whatever it takes to release our inmates. 77 people in their cells waiting to be released. It's such a shame that you cannot talk to your own people because we're all Venezuelans. This is a, a, a the fight to, really, to give freedom to our country. And instead, we are insulted. We are persecuted. They just, to me, these are tests for us in order to continue to fight. I will overcome these hurdles, and I will continue. But the attack, we are basically people who are Corina Machado. She cannot hold office. We cannot vote for her. Ceballo, same thing. Carlos Vecchio, he's a candidacy for the National Assembly has been annulled. So that I hope that you have for the elections of uh, December 6, in spite of the fact that they cannot serve in their function, um, do you believe that there could be another positive result? Yes. Why? Because we are the majority. Because for the first time, after 16 years, we are a majority. The opposition is united, is more united than ever. It has grown, it has strengthened. We have realized that because I'm part of the unity, because Leopoldo is part of the democratic unity. And since Leopoldo has been in jail, I've been in constant communication with all the leaders in my country. And I belong, together with Mitzi Capriles de Ledesma, I'm part of the uh, Human Rights uh, Commission of this democratic uh, electoral uh, station. We are a majority, and we we'll experience that. We feel it, and it's in the people. We trust our people. People will go out and vote. Let's assume, Lillian, that in the elections, things will go great for you, and you do gain a majority in the assembly as a hypothesis. But the executive branch, the military, the judiciary is in the hands of a different government. You're going to have to open up a dialogue and negotiate with them. Are you willing to do that? Of course. You must do it. Justice, of course, will have to investigate the cases that are necessary, but the dialogue, the opening, reconciliation and forgiveness all Venezuelans uh, need to own that. Otherwise, we are trapped in our own negative sentiment, and we cannot allow that. We need to go beyond. We need to do and give the best of us. When I say the best of us, I'm saying to leave aside the rage, the pain, the rancor, which is very difficult. I know that. But we need to go beyond. And that's what the country demands from us. That sentiment to go from being outraged to action is exactly what our country is demanding. But before I answer your question, and to see the assembly as a majority of the opposition. I don't like to call them the opposition. To see the majority of an assembly that wants to see progress is not the opposition. We are talking about the entire Venezuela. 
What I like to say is that we're going through a sabotaged electoral process with locked borders, with media that are being censored and controlled by the government, with political uh, inhabilitations. This is a landscape where you know that everything will be rigged. Of course, they want to cheat on us, but we are a majority, and the Venezuelan is not going to allow that. We need to be there. We need to get to the election. We need to vote. We need to wait until we count the votes at the uh, polling stations, of course, the uh, people will have to um, go through strenuous work, but we're going to do it. We need to be there with our family members and our friends, and we're going to count the votes, and we hope that our success will be acknowledged, but we need international observation that is qualified. And still, nowadays, we're 12 days from the due date, from the OAS and the European Union, and up until the last day, we are going to fight for that because we are not fighting for something that we don't deserve or something that is not right. It's uh, the, what n should happen in a country that's going to go through an election. And it's also a country in crisis that we need the election. We need election. We believe in the process, in the constitutional process. And we want election that is transparent. We know that that's not the case today, but we trust. And I call on all of you here present, uh, please help us. I call on all the international entities, the U European Union, the OAS, and UNASUR. UNASUR as well, of course. So UNASUR is an international entity. UNASUR will come because uh, it's a, uh, I want them to come. UNASUR, the Union of South America Nations, and can they guarantee that they are an independent international body? We hope that they will take steps and to be impartial. They must be there. They will be there. And nowadays, the entire world knows what's happening in Venezuela. Today, they know. And people are very aware. We are not alone. If you had President Maduro in front of you because he grants you a hearing to talk to him, what would you tell him? I would tell him what I feel. And what would you ask him? how I feel as a Venezuelan. I will try to convey to him what most Venezuelans feel that claim for justice and peace. And I would ask him to release all the political prisoners and uh, to respect the Venezuelan constitution in Article 23, which is very clear to respect all the international organisms so that uh, what's happening in Venezuela stops happening. Article 23 says that all international organization linked to Venezuela needs to be respected, meaning the United Nations that have asked five times to release uh, Leopoldo Lopez. And Maduro violates the Venezuelan constitution, Article 23, just like they violate most of its articles. That's what I would ask him, to respect the Constitution that they use as advertising. They hold it in their hands and they don't comply with it. If they were to pardon Leopoldo so that he can be released, pardoned by the government, but only him, not all of the 77, would he accept it, Leopoldo? No. No. First of all, there is nothing to pardon or to forgive him. He's innocent. The only thing that Leopoldo did was to raise his voice, to politically say in a responsible way what was happening in Venezuela. He proposed a constitutional solution to the disaster. How? With citizens' assemblies that were going to take place in 2014 in order to find within the Constitution five ways, five solutions. And during the second assembly uh, on February 12, they throw him in jail, accusing him of facts that were completely, completely rigged and fake. It was just to send Leopoldo in jail. And there's nothing to be forgiven. Actually, we need to uh, forgive him and to the leaders to um, actually um, express uh, ourselves. But Locoldo has said it very well. Don't release me. Just release the innocent uh, prisoners. 
eh, Emilio Tudel, Mantilla, Gilberto Sojo, Daniel Ceballos, just release our uh, city mayor, Antonio Ledesma. He's a democratic. He always tells me, don't talk about me, just talk about the others, just name people that nobody knows, uh, the unknown people, like Inesita, she's in jail because she put some tweets against the government. Uh, a rebel? Yes, but that's freedom of speech. You are entitled to say what you think, always. This is a constitutional right. And because of her tweets, Inesita is in jail. Inesita has already an order of release. and. They don't let her out. She's kidnapped, kidnapped. Judge Susana Barrientos, who condemned and sentenced Leopoldo, have you met with her? No. Can you explain to us what was the charge based on which they um, condemned him to 13 years, nine months, seven days, and 12 hours. That was his sentence. Susana Barreros is a judge. Just like any other judge, you can talk to her in a hallway if there is democracy. I was never able to look into her eyes because she never looked into my eyes. And because when she came to the courtroom and came out, she was escorted by the military and the police officers. She is being kidnapped by the system, by Maduro's regime. She's kidnapped by the FUNI effect. The FUNI effect infiltrates the walls of the Justice Palace and terrifies judges and lawyers of the Venezuelan justice. That's the truth. And we are hopeful because the trial is com it's a short trial. It's unfair. It's secret. No evidence, no witnesses. Just by listening to the witnesses by the prosecutor, we listen to all the witnesses and not even one, not a single witness accuses Leopoldo of anything, not even the students. Rather, those who were who took the word say good things. Uh, as a politician who tells the truth, and they analyzed his speeches, the social networks, they couldn't find anything. There were four charges, and there's no way of connecting Leopoldo with any of those charges, and he's been accused of those four charges. Even a fire, there was never a fire. Uh, it was proved that it was no fire. Actually, they actually included a fire. And uh, nowadays we see the spokesperson of the person, president of the National Assembly, asking for more years for Leopoldo because he has to be accused of several deaths. It really is something that is incredible and it's irresponsible. Absolutely violated the constitution, the lights, uh, and any, any type of order. So that's why Venezuela see this uh, situation where Leopoldo is living in jail and he lived through that trial. All of Venezuelans are living through that. Leopoldo is in jail, but Venezuela is also a prisoner. And we have to free the country. We have the faith, the capital, uh, the human capital, and everything else to do so. But we are hopeful because Leopoldo is innocent. So every time we went to the hearings, we said, well, look, uh, this is actually Actually, you know, okay, you know, um, uh, Maduro can actually say, okay, you know, I free. So presidents can have a way, you know, okay. I well, we thought maybe, you know, it will not be just, but then they will let me uh, go. But you know, not even that, not even that. If you had known at the time that he uh, surrendered that the result would be uh, this one, would you have let him do it? Do you think he would have surrendered, even knowing what the consequences would be? Yes, he would. He would have done it. And you? No, I never wanted him to surrender. <laughs> I told him no. And he said yes. And I said why? And when he explained it to me, I think that the, I understood many things in my life. And I understood a lot about who was Leopoldo. And he said, look, my baby, if I leave the country or if I hide, the country is going to continue the same. 
and every day is going to be worse. I have to face this, and I have to say to the world what is going on in my country. And only that way, I will be free. And I understood it, and I admire him, because I tell you, I admire him. Leopoldo decided to free Venezuela and asked me to take care of his children, because you know, that's his passion. I'm going to be in jail. I have a commitment with all Venezuelans, and he actually faced that for three, uh, because of three uh, reasons. I, I am saying that he's innocent, but everybody is saying the same thing, not just me, Human Rights International and other entities, and then also the national defense and the international ones, including uh, ex-president Felipe Gonzalez from Spain. Secondly, he loves Venezuela, and he is never going to leave Venezuela, never. And third, he has a commitment with each Venezuelan. Well, he has gone around the country three times. He went all over, well, three times six, well, 2005 to 2014. He went from end to end of the country because you have to remember that this persecution dates back from the 10 years because, because he actually uh, became a mayor and then he actually went to inter-American uh, court and then he actually won the case that was presented against him and then what happened? You know, Venezuela left the inter-American court. So uh, they uh, supported Enrique Capriles and then Leopoldo knows, knows his people and in his cell right now, right there, he trusts uh, in every and each one of us. Uh, Lilian Cuba has uh, still a very, uh, an in very important influence uh, like uh, when Chavez was president. Yes, I think so, yes. Well, it's the same system. And if there are such an imp important changes in Cuba as the relationship with the U.S., uh, the visit of the Pope, and the uh, peace process in Colombia. Do you think that this is also going to be something positive for Venezuela? Yes, I believe so, and I hope so, and we trust that it's going to be that way. We cannot isolate ourselves from the world. And I believe, well, I know that I'm not supposed to say this, you know, well, you know. Well, I say that uh, Maduro is isolated today from the world, not the country. He is. He. Because it's a country in crisis, and we reject what is happening in Venezuela, the systematic violation of human rights. What happens in Venezuela has an echo in Latin America. So we are very close to that, you know. So uh, we trust that that's going to be so and to be able to achieve peace and stability. We are going to accept some questions. Adriana, you tell me. Well, over there, uh, please uh, say who you are, what is your name, where you come from. I want to congratulate you. I'm from Chile. Well, actually, this is uh, similar to what Allende went through. We cannot hear. Sorry. I'm sorry. I congratulate you for uh, your courage. I understand you because we went through the same uh, socialism and persecution with Allende. I see that you also went to my country, to Chile. Uh, I don't, well, just uh, people can understand you, but uh, I don't know if that can help you. Uh, um, Mrs. Bachelet is very good friend of Maduro, so I, I know that you've gone all over South America. And it's really something very positive. What do you think is positive for you? Well, wherever we went, 
solidarity. We felt that, that we had solidarity. We went through Ibero-America, and in every country, we went to the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate, and uh, uh, the support has been great. And I take this opportunity to send my thanks to all the senators and uh, representatives in Latin America that actually rejected uh, the sentence of my uh, husband, Leopoldo Gonzalez. And this is something that uh, actually, uh, you know, touches uh, us all because uh, human rights have no borders. To all these countries, well, we, we went asking for solidarity and we found solidarity, but we uh, have other steps to take and I believe that those steps must be taken. You talk about the peace process in Colombia. We all want this uh, peace process, but you cannot uh, um, uh, have peace in Colombia if there is no peace in Venezuela. Those are neighbor and, and, and countries that are one next to the other, and then you cannot have peace without justice. That's the truth. That's the truth. We are totally interlinked, and uh, this goes beyond politics, individual politics. You know, when you think about Latin American region, and what do we want also for the 21st century? What do we want? What is happening in Venezuela can happen uh, uh, in any country of the world, uh, and we cannot allow that. Let's take um, another question. Please, I ask you to ask questions and not give opinions. Sir? Hello? Yes, um, Mr. Tentori. As a spokesperson for the opposition in Venezuela and as someone who has been in constant contact with the opposition leaders, could you explain three things for me? One, why did the opposition parliamentarians support President Maduro's decree claiming uh, Esequibo in Guyana? And two, if the opposition leaders are elected and they win the next election, can you tell us whether or not they're prepared to renounce their claim on Guyana's territory and failing which, submit that claim to the International Court of Justice? Thank you. Who can actually do a translation of the question that this uh, uh, gentleman posed? Thank you. The issues of Guyana, which is the first one, and the one about borders, that, that this is what Maduro is putting there to uh, deviate the attention. So the Guyana case is, uh, didn't uh, work, and then now we have the border, you know, and there are different points in the border, and they want to sabotage an electoral process. Uh, in 64 days to the election, you cannot actually create smoke uh, uh, curtains uh, or smoke walls, you know. So the truth is that the crisis is so deep in Venezuela and the country cannot do it alone. And then the international community is required to be there. Lilian Rosana Figuera, and I am a an entrepreneur uh, from Venezuela who lives in New York, and many Venezuelans are outside the country. My question is, what is your message to the Venezuelans who are abroad? What can we do, each one of us individually, outside Venezuela, to actually disseminate this message? How can we commit the, the societies where we are and uh, in what areas can we have an impact to help uh, uh, towards this cause uh, for the Venezuelan plan? 
Besides that, I admire you uh, deeply as a mother and as a Venezuela. Well, thank you. Well, a lot. Well, from our struggle, the struggle, which is actually this Venezuelan cause, actually nowadays in the world, the thing that is most valuable for our struggle well, you all, because we are actually going all over the world looking for uh, justice and freedom and uh, positions all over the world, and actually uh, that is denounced what uh, is happening in Venezuela. And wherever you are, you are very close uh, to the international entities that actually uh, who can make that the uh, human rights are respected and are promoted. Here, I will put you in communication with Dario, who is uh, uh, actually uh, exiled. You know, he actually, they did an arbitrary, they just cut him uh, and they hit him and they just took him away. And the uh, people, the people rescued him. They actually faced the military just with bare hands because they didn't have any types of weapons. And then we actually reject violence. And with bare hands, they picked him and they took him from the military. Dario is here. He lives in Panama. And he is an international network of Venezuelans all over the world. And every day they work on these specific strategic points to actually uh, act internally in Venezuela. So here, you already have uh, Dario. Uh, so you get together and you can help us. Sir? Well, thank you. Welcome. Can you talk a little bit louder? My question is, do you think that more sanctions against the government of Venezuela will help? And in your discussions, well, it happened. Did you discuss all this uh, with President, uh, Vice President Biden? Yes, with uh, um, John Kerry and Vice President uh, uh, Biden, we talk about human rights, which is actually uh, the biggest uh, claim that we have because of the very deep crisis we're going through because it became a humanitarian crisis, because there is a, a violation of uh, the right to life, because uh, evolution is killed every 20 minutes, the, 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 the freedom, because we have a lot of political prisoners. And then there are many without any preliminary uh, uh, hearings. Um, and the inflation, because also the right to health. We don't have hospitals. Uh, we don't have uh, schools to learn. Uh, and so that is a concentration uh, of what our meetings actually uh, have to do with. Uh, every country has uh, internal decisions. I can talk about Venezuela. I am fighting so that Venezuela actually rescues uh, freedom and to uh, uh, achieve that uh, all the rights actually are available to everybody. OK. Uh, Flores is my name. I'm from the web page. Uh, and uh, my question is the following. What do you think about what was going uh, on with the uh, demands? Because they are not recommendations. They are demands from the UN. What do you think that is happening in Venezuela? Because they don't uh, actually respect uh, these decisions. Uh, so what can we do so that it, they become effective? And when are they going to appeal uh, this sentence? When is it going to be appealed? Okay, thank you very much for your uh, question.
Well, part of the international defense of what was going on in Venezuela is that the uh, democratic charter is not being respected. And then the UN, the Human Rights uh, Watch, also asked for the freedom of Leopoldo because to have a conscious awareness uh, a prisoner, uh, this is the first time in Latin America. Um, the one, uh, the, the article that they violated is number 23. Venezuela is part of the uh, Security Council. We have gone many times to uh, the UN and also here and in Geneva, and they know what's going on, and we cannot lose our hope. And we have to continue demanding that the international treaties are respected. And not only that, but also uh, to, to highlight that they are not being complied with. There is no law that protects them uh, from uh, non-compliance. Really, they, want, they do whatever they want because they don't have any order. Because not even their other countries, even when they uh, voice their opinion, they don't listen because this is the last stage. This is a country in crisis, and they don't want to accept it. And they, they, they have to accept for Venezuelans, for us, for our children, because the ones who are going to suffer the most in the end in a country the way it is, well, our children are the ones because we want them to grow in our country and to develop. And, and if we don't achieve this change, what is going to happen? Lily, and uh, during the last 15 years, I have uh, uh, heard that we are in the last uh, stage or stretch because nowadays we are a majority because the people in Venezuela want a political and deep change. They want a change. It's uh, not sustainable economically and socially and politically. It's unsustainable. It's women in Venezuela. You know, nowadays uh, you have, uh, they have to stand hours uh, to get, uh, uh, to get um, food. And actually, people who have taken pictures of these uh, lines actually have gone uh, to light because they don't want uh, these uh, photographs of the lack of health care. And uh, uh, actually, there was a lady who was waiting uh, who wanted uh, a chicken. And then the women started you know, to fight, to fight for a chicken. They started charging. And this lady, 86 years old, fell down, and she was trampled and she was killed. A little old lady, 86 years old, she could be my grandmother, your mother, your aunt, your sister. This is a humanitarian crisis because of the profound uh, uh, bad situation in Venezuela. I'm president of the Social um, Security, and I'm also uh, an ambassador of Venezuela, a country we love very much. Following up with what you were talking about, the lines and so on, aren't you afraid uh, with this uh, lack of medication and food that, that we actually also, and then the 96% that is imported in terms of food for Venezuela without having any more resources to import food. Don't you think that this is a, a, a violence? Uh, what, what, are you, what do you think about violence between now and the elections? Well, if there is violence, OK, very good question. If there is violence, as we have seen, then actually, you know, it has to do with Maduro's regime. They have the weapons. If they don't respect the Constitution, and then they violate with their uh, power and by the weapons any law or any process, well, uh, we are talking about the Maduro's regime. We reject violence. We want a electoral process that is peaceful. We, ha we want to vote, and we want to count the votes. Yes, we do want to count, because we are a majority, and we are sure that we are going to win. But violence, it belongs to them. They are the ones, uh, the 12th of February, where they actually uh, lit the violence 
uh, when they actually, the 10th of September, in the, uh, when they actually uh, sentenced uh, Leopoldo, I went there and I came in and out and I had no problems. But the day that Leopoldo was uh, sentenced, they actually sent me uh, um, people who were from Maduro, they actually sent um, or through uh, uh, stones and the chairs, Antonieta, my mother-in-law, they threw her on the floor, you know. I sent her a kiss because uh, she is really uh, my uh, strength, she gives me strength. Actually, so the media was there, and then we could never get to the media because the, the, the pro-Maduro people, they uh, impeded us. Uh, they took the micros from the uh, journalists. They took the uh, cameras, and then you have the images on television, and then so uh, actually you had the flags of the opposition parties of Voluntad Popular. Everything happened that day, and I told the military, when the, there is Manuela Bolivar who was pregnant. She was a candidate. She's really courageous and she's pregnant. And they hit her. And then she was saying, I was pregnant. And they continued. Everything was uh, taped. And then I asked, Who are the violent ones? They are the ones. And I went through the barrier of the military guys. And they wanted to separate me from the media. And I said to the military guys, who is in charge? And he said, Colonel, OK, the question, what's going on? Well, no, here, violence, I said, so what is, what is the violence? The group over there. I said, why are you doing something? Why don't you take those people who are violent? They did nothing. They didn't do anything. And I said, Colonel, this is what happened the 12th of February. And because of this, Leopoldo is in jail because they actually uh, accused uh, of violence uh, to Leopoldo that was generated by the Maduro people. And the colonel looked at me like that, went like that, and then made a gesture like this. That was the order. That is the order that comes from above. This is what I have uh, heard in the last few months. It comes from above. The violence comes from them. Thank you, Lillian. My name is Robert Gonzalez. I'm an activist uh, of uh, human rights uh, for many years. I'm an exile. My brother has been murdered by Valentin Santana from uh, uh, 23 de Enero, the, where I come from. What do you tell that Venezuela that you want for all of us, to those of us who are so scared of having our family killed, to take to the streets? What's your message to the fear? I've been living in the US for 17 years. I'm still afraid for my family. How can I overcome that fear to have that courage that characterizes you? Thank you. Robert, it's tough. It's very hard, but you need to overcome it because the country needs us. I understand you. A year ago, they killed my best friend in El Avila after being in jail. One of my best friends in El Avila is such a deep pain because my best girlfriends became uh, widows. It's very, very difficult uh, to understand, to imagine this. Johnny Montoya is the brother of Juancho Montoya the Chavista collective that was killed on uh, February the 12th. Johnny Montoya was killed, Juancho. And Johnny, imagine, Johnny, they killed his own brother. I talked to Johnny, we met. We got hold of each other and Johnny said, I'm scared, I'm petrified, they killed my brother, they're coming for my family, uh, we are surrounded, too many weapons. And I said to him, Johnny, from being outraged to the action. I need you. Join me. Come with me. And he came with me to the tour, meeting with Vice President Biden. Johnny was there at that meeting. And Johnny is active. He's getting ready. He wants to become the political voice in Venezuela because his testimony uh, is very important. 
uh, to join and undertake this fight, and he's ready to go. The fear, I believe, that we can overcome it with our commitment, with our engagement, with clear objective to do things with love, with uh, great unity among everybody. And once we're done, I'm going to come and hug you, because I hope that my hug can help you overcome the fear, because we need to trust each other. Last question. Last question. Time is up. The men at the end of the room, in the back. Good morning, Ramon Santo from Frank Express Agency. Lillian, I have a couple of questions for you. You have come to the New York uh, in the framework of the UN uh, to denounce what's happening to Leopoldo Lopez. If you can tell us, who have you met? Uh, what uh, political representatives have you talked to these past few days? And my second question has to do with the fact that you have undertook this campaign denouncing what has happened to Leopoldo Lopez. After the sentence, how can the strategy be different now? How does it change now? Um, what are the ch changes in the strategy? As far as our participation here during UN Week of the General Assembly, we have held meetings with different leaders, global leaders, private meetings, good meetings, hopeful meetings, and I'm confident that they will have results. As for the strategy, our only strategy is the truth. Our only strategy is to continue to go forward until we can achieve our goal, which is to release our political prisoners, innocent uh, politicians, uh, and to release, liberate Venezuela, a country in which all rights are for everybody, to achieve economic stability, to achieve results, facts in Venezuela, to achieve tranquility, peace, security in our country. That's our goal. And there's no doubt that we will achieve that. Is it difficult? Yes. It requires a lot. But there are thousands of us that seek the same. And together, we're all going to achieve that, all for freedom. And time is over. Just like Isaac said, I'd like to thank Lillian Isaac for such an interesting conversation. And I'd like to thank your honesty and also to uh, hope and wish that you go back to Venezuela with uh, the uncertainty that you have so many people that support you, that believe in Venezuela, that believe in you, and that want to support and help Venezuela, which is the most important thing. Thank you very much.